my life. Hello, visionaries. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. For those of you who don't know, my name is Marisa Talbert. I am the founder and CEO of Talbert Law Office, your favorite go-to legal resource for all things business, nonprofit, and intellectual property law. It's been two weeks since I've been gone and I've missed you dearly. Um, I am back and we are going to continue on our business entity series. And so far, we've talked about the sole proprietorship, the partnership, and the LLC. And today, we are talking all about the infamous C Corp. You know how we do. Let's jump right into it. So first, let's talk about what is a C Corp. A C Corp is a business entity generally known as a corporation. Its corporate status is indicated by one of these designations, the corporation or corp, company or co, incorporation or inc, or limited, the LTD. And the C-Corp is the most common type of corporation. The C in C-Corp comes from the fact that this type of business entity is operated and taxed under subchapter C of the Internal Revenue Code. Now, for the purposes of this video, I will be discussing privately held C-Corporations, which means C-Corps that are not publicly traded and do not offer stock on a public stock exchange. Just for the sake of clarity, there are different privately held C-Corps. You could have a general stock corporation or a closed corporation, which both of those do have different requirements. So depending on your state of formation, it may be important to be aware of that distinction. There are definitely a number of differences between those two types of privately held corporations here in California where I'm licensed. So I just wanted to make that clear. On the other hand, there are C corporations that are publicly traded or are considered open corporations. These are the types of business entities that you think of when you think of big business, such as Macy's or FedEx or Bank of America or Dell Computers. As many of you know, a corporation is separate from its business owner. So similar to Lisa, the LLC, your corporation is its own person under the law. And again, this separation protects its owners from personal liability for debts and obligations of the corporation. This protection bubble limits that liability to what has been invested into the company. Now, as always, there are some exceptions to this liability protection, which is called piercing the corporate veil, but that needs its own separate video. If you are interested in learning more about how you can lose that protection in a corporate structure, let me know down below in the comments. However, generally speaking, you'll most likely be protected as long as you're not doing anything negligent, illegal, or reckless. This C-Corp is unlike any other business structure that we've talked about in our business entity series so far. So let's break down these specifics. First, let's talk about corporate ownership. A corporation issues shares, also known as stock, to indicate ownership. The more shares you own in a corporation, the more ownership you have. It is also very important to note that a C Corp can have multiple classes of stock. Unlike an S Corporation, which is the business entity that we'll discuss next. But in a nutshell, a C Corporation may have different classes of stock that attach different rights and responsibilities. This can be extremely beneficial if a corporation wants to offer a class of stock with voting rights so that the founders of the corporation can have the right to vote on decisions. But maybe a venture capitalist or an investor would have a different class of stock with no voting rights because they're just there really to help raise the capital. There are several scenarios where different classes of stock may come in handy. Another example is if you wanted to offer stock options to employees. You'd want to ensure that you have different classes of stock between those who own the corporation and those who are employed by the corporation. Again, if you would like a video that just breaks down the different classes of stock, let me know in the comments. The last thing that I will say about shares is that depending on the state in which you formed your corporation, you may or may not be required to register those shares with a state or other governmental entity. So speaking of ownership, let's talk a little bit more about the who that owns the corporation. A C-Corp is owned by shareholders or stockholders. 
A C Corp generally has no limit on the number of shareholders that it can have. The main responsibilities of a shareholder includes investing capital, voting on certain matters, receiving dividends, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, and electing the corporate board of directors. Now, the board of directors consists of directors and officers who manage the corporation. I will make a video to further differentiate between directors and officers, but to put it plainly, directors oversee, appoint, and remove officers, and officers run the day-to-day -day operations as the corporate executives. You'll often hear the word officer in their title. So you have your CEO, your chief executive officer. You may have a COO, your chief operating officer, or you may have a CFO, your chief financial officer. Just to recap, the shareholders own the corporation, directors oversee the officers, and officers manage the day-to-day -day operations of the corporation. So now, let's jump right into startup formalities. So previously, we've discussed business entities that impose little to no formal requirements for startup. This is not the case with a corporation. A corporate formation is very formal and requires very specific maintenance to stay legally compliant. For starters, you must register your corporation with your Secretary of State. Your corporation is formed by what is known as the Articles of Incorporation. Your articles will generally discuss the name of the corporation, the purpose of the business, the authorized number of shares, your agent for service of process, and your incorporators, which may be the founders or it may be the person that you've hired to complete all the paperwork, such as a lawyer or a legal zoom. In the course of your corporate formation, you may also need to draft bylaws. Your state of formation will determine whether bylaws are required for your corporation. Your bylaws is a legally binding document that establishes the rules for your corporation, and it helps to promote internal governance. So whether you're legally required to or not, you should adopt bylaws. Once you adopt bylaws, all of your decision-making for the corporation must comply with those bylaws, and they must be upheld by your shareholders, your directors, your officers, your employees, and any other third party that interacts with your corporation. Corporate bylaws commonly includes very specific information about how many directors your corporation may have. How do they get elected? What are their qualifications? How long are they allowed to serve in their position? It can also specify when, where, and how the board conducts and calls meetings. Adopting bylaws can really help to save time and energy down the line because you've already put certain processes in writing. If there's a conflict or a question about a decision that's being made on behalf of the corporation, your bylaws would be your referencing document. Please note that the bylaws are a living document. So it's not a one and done situation. You can continue to update and amend your bylaws as necessary for the continued smooth operations of your corporation. If something isn't working, change the bylaws to fix it. Corporations are also required to maintain meeting minutes. Minutes are just notes that are taken at every meeting when either the shareholders or the board of directors are transacting business for the corporation. This means that a corporation should maintain minutes for shareholder meetings, for board of director meetings, and even for committee meetings. Basically, any meeting internal to the corporation and its decision-making, minutes should be kept. If someone needs to recall a decision that was voted on, they can refer back to the meeting minutes as a reminder. For example, let's say a director at XX Corporation proposes to its entire board of directors that the corporation spend a million dollars in support of Black-owned businesses for the year. Let's say the entire board voted yes to support the Black-owned businesses, but one director proposed to double the spending from $1 million to $2 million over that year. And the board had a discussion and ultimately approved spending 1.5 million. 
This is the type of information that you'd want to have recorded in your meeting minutes to refer back to. If the corporation's accountant needed proof that this transaction was approved, you'd have the meeting minutes to refer back to. And those meeting minutes would show who was present at the meeting, who introduced the proposed activity to be voted on, and who and how many directors voted for or against the proposed activity. Another reason to maintain detailed corporate minutes is to protect your tax benefits. When decisions are made and expenses are incurred within the corporation, your minutes may help to answer questions if you have an IRS audit or if you're trying to claim certain tax deductions. If you lack in your corporate minutes, your tax status might not have the same benefits that you could potentially enjoy. Another important governing document is the corporate resolution. Some people may vary in how to use a corporate resolution, but it's just a written document created by the board of directors that details a binding corporate action. This is similar to the minutes, but it doesn't necessarily accompany a corporate meeting. My personal recommendation is to use corporate resolutions when you're making a single or impromptu decision such as the decision to maybe change banks or to remove or add a director. Just to clarify, meeting minutes record an entire meeting, and that includes all the decisions that are made at that meeting. Alternatively, a resolution records an actual decision for a specific matter. The last governing document that I will discuss is the shareholders agreement. Most states do not require a shareholders agreement. But that does not mean that you don't have to have one, especially when you have multiple owners in a privately held corporation. In a corporation, the shareholders agreement plays the same role of an operating agreement to an LLC or a partnership agreement to a partnership. A shareholders agreement is just an arrangement among the corporate owners that describes the shareholders' rights and responsibilities and documents how the shareholders interact with each other. This agreement can include, but is not limited to, how shareholders can transfer ownership in the corporation, who they can transfer ownership to. For example, let's say it's a family starting a C-Corp as a family business. The shareholders agreement could explicitly limit other shareholders from transferring their ownership interests to third parties who are not family. The agreement will discuss how many and the type of shares each shareholder owns, how dividends will be distributed and who will receive those dividends first, it will discuss how much ownership is required to make certain decisions within the corporation, such as a requirement for 51% of the vote to change the name of the company or to merge with another business. The shareholders agreement may discuss what to do if there's a 50-50 deadlock for a certain issue or what happens in the event that a shareholder dies or retires, in the event that a shareholder's interest is to be bought out. How will the value be determined? There are many, many decisions that can be made ahead of time through the shareholders agreement. So now that we've talked about the shareholders agreement, let's talk about how these shareholders actually get paid without working as an employee for the corporation. The shareholders of a corporation get paid through distributions, most commonly known as dividends. Dividends are paid out of the corporation's profits. Many companies pay dividends in cash, but they can also be paid in the form of physical assets, investment securities, and real estate. For shareholders, Dividends increase the net worth of that shareholder by the amount of the dividend. For corporations, dividends are a liability because they reduce the company's assets by the amount of total dividends paid out. Last but not least, you know we got to talk about these taxes. So far, we've only talked about business entities with pass-through taxation, which means those owners report taxes for the business on their own personal income tax returns. That is not the case for the corporation. C-Corps are double taxed. This means that a C-Corp pays taxes on the profits of the corporation, and these taxes are paid on the corporation's taxable income, which may include payroll or employment taxes, any property taxes, any excise taxes, or even customs duty taxes if they're importing or exporting certain goods. Likewise, employees pay taxes on their income and shareholders pay taxes on their dividends. In 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act changed the corporate tax rate from a graduating sliding scale upwards of 35% to 
to a 21% flat rate for all corporations. So after learning about all these complex formalities and this double taxation, knowing that the objective of any business is to maximize profits, why would anyone want to start a C corporation? Well, let's go back and recap all of the advantages. Number one, a C corporation creates a separate legal identity or a separate legal person. A corporation has a life of its own, with its own rights, its own responsibilities, its own capabilities, and its own liabilities. It can buy and own its own property, enter into its own contracts, lend money, and invest its own funds. Number two, a C-Corp creates limited liability for its owners. A corporation is responsible for its own debts and obligations, not the shareholders. Number three, a C-Corp creates perpetual existence. Once a corporation is formed, it can outlast all of its shareholders until it is dissolved, unless its governing documents state otherwise. Number four, a C-Corp creates a separation between the ownership of the shareholders and the management of the board of directors. That's very important. Number five, depending on the governing documents, there are no restrictions on who can hold shares and become an owner in a C corporation. Number six, transfer of ownership is quite easy, unlike an LLC. Number seven, corporate law is well established. So that makes it easier to predict legal consequences for decisions that the board of directors or the shareholders make. Also, it is easier to draft agreements that can protect investors, shareholders, and the board of directors. Number eight, a C-Corp makes it much easier to attract investors and raise capital through equity financing. Number nine, through a C-Corp, you have the ability to offer stock options and other really special incentives that no other business entity allows. And number 10, the C-Corp allows the opportunity to take advantage of tax benefits throughout the life of the business. Well, that's all I have for this video. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And if you wanna learn more about piercing the corporate veil or the different types of stocks that a C-Corp can offer, let me know in the comments. If this video was helpful to you, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And until next time, this is Talbert Law Office, your favorite go-to legal resource for all things business, nonprofit, and intellectual property law. I'll see you in the next video. I made it this far.